Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, a weekly show with relevant news and flying tips for pilots and student pilots to help keep you safe. I'm Max Truscott. Today, we're talking about midair collisions, as there were two separate midairs last week, one in Alaska and one here in California. And midair collisions have been on my mind since I had two near midair collisions last week with the same aircraft. So we'll be talking about avoiding midair and near midair collisions after the news, and I'll tell you my bizarre story. By the way, if you have thought about maybe someday buying a Cirrus SR20, SR22, or SF50 Vision Jet, or would like flight training in one, there are a lot of things I can do to help you out. So please give me a ring today, 650-967-2500, for a free consultation and possibly a free demo flight. Now, last week in episode 108, we talked with airline pilot Carl Valeri about how to become an airline pilot. So if you missed that episode, you may want to check it out. This week in the news, the American Bonanza Society needs some help, and they are offering $200,000 in prizes to people with fixes for a design issue. And a helicopter pilot in Massachusetts has been arrested for illegal flights. All this and more, and the news starts now. Well, last week's midair collision in Alaska is unusual in that so many people were involved. This comes from the MaritimeExecutive.com. NTSB releases details of Ketchikan, Alaska sightseeing crash. The midair collision killed five cruise ship passengers and one pilot outside Ketchikan as both aircraft were headed back to the harbor, according to the NTSB. Ten other people survived, mostly with injuries. At a press briefing, NTSB said that the larger of the two flight plans involved, the Havilland Otter, operated by Takan Air, was returning to Ketchikan from a sightseeing flight on a southwesterly course at about 3,800 feet. It descended to about 3,200 to 3,300 feet, where its course converged with another inbound seaplane, a de Havilland Beaver operated by Mountaineer Service. The collision caused both aircraft to crash in George Inlet, a fjord located about seven miles from Ketchikan. All the passengers on board both aircraft were guests from the cruise ship Royal Princess. Both aircraft were equipped with a transponder, and neither aircraft carried a flight data recorder. And by the way, I'd like to point out that the aircraft were flying in the same direction when they collided, which, as we'll talk about later, is actually very common, and yet we spend most of our time as pilots scanning for traffic in front of us and to the side. From Fox40.com, another mid-air collision. This time, NTSB is investigating a collision in Sutter County, California, that's up north of Sacramento. Just two days after the midair in Alaska, two pilots were killed when their crop dusters collided in Sutter County. Investigators with the NTSB are looking into what may have caused the midair collision. Meanwhile, aviation experts are weighing in on how difficult rice planting from the air can be. Friends of the pilots said they don't know how the two experienced pilots managed to collide while planting rice seed on Wednesday afternoon. Friend Tom Biley said, you think there's so much sky out there and how is it possible that two people run into each other? You just can't believe that it can. The NTSB is now in the fact-gathering phase of the investigation. Scott Miller, professor of aeronautics at Sacramento City College, said that the Grumman Ag Cats are designed to operate low and slow and close to the ground, and he said sometimes pilots fly as low as only five feet above the fields they're planting rice in. While he doesn't know what happened, he believes that both planes were turning around when the collision happened. Quote, When you get to the end of the field, you need to make a reversal maneuver, which involves a pretty high pitch up and then a turn around back down maneuver, he said. And it appears just by looking at the location of the fields that they were working, that possibly there was a mutual pull up and just terrible, terrible, tragic bad luck. Now, when we get into our discussion later about mid-air collisions, I want to point out that this is a collision between agriculture aircraft and, according to the data I've seen, they are involved disproportionately in mid-air collisions. From avweb.com, the FAA's 20-year forecast is GA stable, airlines up, and drones way up. The FAA has published its aerospace forecast for 2019 to 2039. The report takes into account global economic factors to project demand for aircraft, pilots, and facilities over the next two decades. Broadly, the FAA sees stable growth for airlines, overall stability for GA, even as the mix within GA of missions and aircraft are expected to change, and dramatic growth of the drone sector. For the airlines, the FAA is predicting total employments to grow steadily through the period from just over $800 million in 2019 to roughly $1.1 billion by 2039. While this rate is impressive, the FAA is actually expecting the overall rate of growth for domestic airline flying to be lower than it has been in recent years. To no one's surprise, the FAA is also predicting a steady rise in load factors for airlines from just under 85% today to a little over 86.5% by 2039, so stop dreaming about an open middle seat next to you. 
For general aviation, the FAA says the long-term outlook is stable to optimistic as growth at the high end offsets continuing retirements at the traditionally low end of the segment. The active GA fleet is forecast to remain relatively level between 2019 and 2039. It notes continued growth for the turbine and rotorcraft fleets, but for the largest segment of the fleet, the fixed-wing piston aircraft, there's going to be some shrinkage over the forecast period. There may be fewer light planes in the fleet, but overall GA will be flying more, according to the forecast. The number of general aviation hours flown is projected to increase an average of 0.8% per year through 2039, as growth in turbine, rotorcraft, and experimental offsets a decline in fixed-wing piston hours. But by far the biggest surprise is the FAA's prediction around UAVs. More than 175,000 drones were registered with the FAA last year, which boosted the known population by a whopping 170%. Now, that number seemed a little low to me, so I went to the report and I found that the 175,000 refers just to the non-hobby UAS, which are the larger drones that weigh more than 0.55 pounds, mostly used for business, and they have to be individually registered. Previously, the FAA predicted a 44% growth in the segment. If current growth trends continue, the population of registered drones could be more than 420,000 by 2020 and more than double that by 2023. They say significant growth in the sector over the past year demonstrates the uncertainty and potential of the market. We anticipate the growth rate of the sector will slow down over time. Nevertheless, the sector will be larger than what we understood as recently as last year, said the FAA. And we'll include a link to that uh, report in our show notes. By the way, in that forecast, there are no references to flight instruction. Now, I was talking over the weekend with a listener in New Jersey who was asking about the outlook for flight instruction, which I said will continue to remain strong as long as the airlines are growing. But when we eventually see a recession, I expect the demand for flight instruction will drop and that many furloughed airline pilots will go back to becoming CFI. So just my prediction there. From generalaviationnews.com, ADSB is making mountain flying easier. Now, mountains have a bad habit of blocking radar, creating surveillance blind spots for controllers, and forcing IFR aircraft to take inefficient flight paths. Next Gen Radar and ADSB is helping to remove those blind spots, easing the workload for controllers, and boosting efficiency and safety for airline, military, and GA pilots. Now, beginning in June 2018, the FAA has installed a fusion radar upgrade to the STARS radar, that's Terminal Approach Radar System, at the Asheville Regional Airport. Before fusion, STARS radar relied on only one airport surveillance radar at the airport. Now, fusion blends multiple radar feeds from other locations, and here's what's different, as well as the input from seven ADSB radio stations distributed throughout the Asheville, North Carolina area. The ADSB radios receive surveillance data from ADSB out equipped aircraft and transmit that data to Tracon radar. Fusion combines all the surveillance inputs and displays the most accurate information to controllers. Benefits will increase as more aircraft equipped with ADSB, says the FAA. What we do has always been safe, said Asheville Air Traffic Manager Michael Silvius, but this upgrade improves efficiency in addition to giving us a safety boost. For controllers, Fusion provides aircraft position information at lower altitudes and farther from the airport. In many cases, controllers can see aircraft equipped with ADSB out all the way down to the ground, even at some distant airports. When controllers do not have surveillance data on a flight, they have to block out relatively large portions of airspace around an aircraft's expected pass. But with these new capabilities, controllers at the facility are able to better use the airspace by reducing separation between aircraft to as close as three miles to either side of course. He says the upgrade eliminates the workload of remembering aircraft they cannot see on the display. Aircraft equipped with ADS-B out get additional surveillance advantage, coverage that in many cases extends to the runway. 30 miles north of Asheville is a private airport called Mountain Air located within a golf course in the shadow of Mile High Mount Mitchell. Quote, a lot of aircraft fly in and out of Mountain Air. We see them and can point out traffic. We couldn't do that before. Now, I just want to point out this capability is relatively new, I think. There have been numerous times here in my local area, I've heard aircraft ask NorCal Approach if they could see the aircraft's ADSB out signal, and the answer has usually been no, but it looks like that's starting to change around the country. Now, here's a related story about ADSB, also from General Aviation News. 71% of business aircraft already equipped with ADSB. A new report from FlightAware.com shows that as of the end of April 2019, 71% of turbine-powered business aircraft registered in the U.S. are now equipped with ADSB. That's up from 69% in their March 2019 report. The FAA, of course, has mandated that aircraft that fly 
into certain kinds of airspace are now required to have an ADS-B out capability by January 1, 2020. According to Flight Aware, the company plans to update this report monthly. And also from generalaviationnews.com, if you're a mechanical designer, here's a way to pick up a little extra cash. $200,000 in prizes being offered by those who can help save the Bonanza fleet. Interesting story. I was not aware of this issue, but it says the American Bonanza Society Air Safety Foundation is offering cash prizes to those who can come up with a solution to the Beechcraft VTAIL Bonanza's rudder vader problem. Of course, a rudder vader is the VTAIL. Now, here's the problem, according to officials. The grade of magnesium that's used for the rudder vader in the tail of the Model 35 VTAIL Bonanza is very expensive and difficult to find. Magnesium corrodes rapidly when exposed to the atmosphere, and the need to reskin rudder vaders is fairly common. However, there are no approved repairs to even very light damage or corrosion to magnesium rudder vaders except for complete replacement of the skin. Quote, because of their unique characteristics, rudder vaders require precise balance and aerodynamic flutter properties, officials explained. Rudder vaders must be kept comparatively light to avoid excessive aircraft tail heaviness. Now, here's the challenge. You're going to have to engineer a replacement skin or complete replacement control surface that meets balance and flutter protection requirements, that does not adversely affect overall aircraft weight and balance, and that uses readily available materials such as more readily sourced magnesium, aircraft aluminum, composite, or modern long-life fabric covering at costs comparable to existing control reskin or replacement while addressing any issue of dissimilar materials interaction. The ABS Air Safety Foundation Manuel Maciel Aviation Research Prize is designed to spur research and certification of alternatives to current rudder vader skinning techniques. The prize is going to be a maximum payout of $200,000, and here's how it's broken out. $20,000 each to the first five teams from an academic or vocational aerospace engineering or aircraft structures repair program, private enterprise, or engineers working privately or together that can do this. Design a replacement rudder vader skin or control surface replacement meeting all FAA control surface balance and flutter control criteria for at least one iteration of rudder vader design. And they say the design varies in models produced from 1947 to 49, 1950 to 1963, and 1964 to 1982. Across that airplane's entire existing flight envelope invalidates that design using industry acceptable practices. One prize of $100,000 to the first commercial enterprise that earns FAA STC approval for rudder vader reskin or replacement that's valid for all models of Beach Model 35 Bonanza across the airplane's existing flight envelope without adversely restricting the airplane's current loading envelope. And you've got lots of time to do this. Deadline for submission of entries, December 31st, 2025. All right, let's go out there and uh, put our design smarts together and solve this problem. In international news, here's a story that tells you the importance of getting a good breakfast. This comes from SputnikNews.com, and it says trainee pilot passes out in Adelaide-bound flight after missing breakfast and sleep. Well, you've probably heard the importance of having a good breakfast. This pilot, who was traveling from Port Augusta in South Australia to Parafield near Adelaide, began to have a headache 40 minutes into the flight while at 5,500 feet. The ATSB launched an investigation after a pilot flew an airplane while unconscious for roughly 40 minutes due to missing his breakfast. The trainee pilot had not slept well the night before and ate a bottle of Gatorade, a chocolate bar, and some water before flying. He then switched on the autopilot, according to the ATSB report. Shortly after the pilot became unconscious, air traffic control attempted to contact the pilot several times but was unsuccessful. Another plane spotted the aircraft flying southwest of Adelaide and reported that the pilot had finally regained consciousness. The passerby aircraft then escorted the pilot to safety at Parafield Airport. The ATSB report said this occurrence highlights the importance of flight crew assessing their ability to fly prior to flight. It is the flight crew's responsibility to monitor their own health and well-being to ensure that they are well-rested and adequately nourished, especially during single pilot operation. The ATSB said it would provide specific guidance to students regarding sleep patterns and implement methods to ensure that students were well-rested. Students would also be required to log their hours of sleep over the past 24 to 48 hours, including their last meals. The aviation body would also conduct safety briefings to reemphasize the importance of observing company guidelines and responsibilities of the pilot in command with more emphasis on fatigue management. Well, there you have it. In fact, I often tell folks, especially for flights that are longer than an hour or so, make sure you bring something to eat and for sure bring some water with you in the aircraft. Because not only do we have to pre-flight the aircraft, yeah, we got to pre-flight ourselves as well, too. 
From flyer.co.uk, the microlight world is shocked as PM goes into receivership. Leading British microlight manufacturer PM Aviation went into receivership. A buyer for the company is being sought. Andrew Cranfield, one of the owners, said on Facebook, quote, I have run out of money to continue funding the company. It is now an administrative receivership and working with receiver to find a buyer. We are all devastated, but sales have fallen through the floor over the last three months, so it was not possible to continue. However, I hope someone will take it on as it is a unique and world-class capability. BMAA, the British Microlight Aircraft Association, said this news is obviously a terrible blow for UK microlighting, especially for flex-wing flyers, and to all the staff of that organization who have been key to making the world's best flex-wings. What happens next will naturally be of concern to all owners of PM aircraft. The future of PM will largely be in the hands of the receiver. We have no idea at this stage whether the company will be sold as a going concern or not. It is very early days in the process, and it is likely to be a little time before the situation is clear. The BMAA has already had initial discussions with the CAA and will be working with the CAA to find a way in which members' aircraft can be supported. Now, PM Aviation was formed in 2003 combining Mainair Sports and Pegasus Aviation, two small UK-based microlight manufacturers in the 1990s, and it has produced more than 4,000 microlight aircraft and won numerous championships at European and world levels. And finally, from NECN.com, an East Brookfield, Massachusetts man arrested for piloting a helicopter from his backyard. And you might guess there's a little bit more to the story than that. (laughs) There is. Story says a Massachusetts man who had previously had his pilot's license revoked after he helped steal a helicopter has been accused of making dozens of illegal helicopter takeoff and landings from his East Brookfield home. Antonio Santanas Tasso, 59, was arrested in connection with the unlawful flights, according to U.S. Attorney Andrew Lelling. He allegedly made more than 50 flights from his backyard between April and November of 2018. Santa Nastasso's pilot license was revoked in 2000 by the FAA because of his participation in the theft of a helicopter from the Norwood Memorial Airport, officials said. Despite having a revoked license, the suspect operated a Robinson R-22 helicopter from his backyard, according to Lelling's office. When questioned by authorities, Santa Nastasso said allegedly several false statements about his eligibility to pilot the aircraft. He also allegedly said he was unaware his pilot's license was revoked. Santa Nastasso has been charged with flying without proper certification and making false statements to federal agents. If convicted, he faces up to five years in prison, a fine of $250,000, and up to three years of supervised release. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up, my weekly updates. And then we'll get to our main topic about avoiding mid-air and near mid-air collisions. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And welcome back. Here are a few updates. I have been listening to the roar of a P-51 the last few days flying overhead. That means it's spring and the Collings Foundation is back in town. I'm sure you're probably familiar with them. They fly a B-17, B-24, B-25, as well as a P-51 and some other aircraft locations all around the country. And this week they are at Moffett Field here in Silicon Valley, California. So I'm tempted to someday go for a ride in one of their aircraft. I haven't done that yet. Not inexpensive, but certainly a great organization. And by the way, I was picking up uh, takeout food over the weekend at one of our downtown Mountain View, California restaurants and parked right there in front of me was the truck for the Collings Foundation, uh, which I guess helps uh, move their personnel around the country to follow the uh, the aircraft. So I couldn't help but uh, take one of my business cards and Right, welcome to Mountain View on the back of it and stick it on the uh, truck. So anyway, it's nice to have them back here in town. Uh, By the way, they're going to be moving all over the country. So between now and October, they're going to be covering first Northern California, including Livermore, Sacramento, Santa Rosa, Concord, and Eureka before they move up to Oregon and then Washington State. And then they move east across Montana, Wyoming, one stop in Colorado at Fort Collins, Omaha, the Pawaukee Airport in Chicago, which is now called Chicago Executive, then on to Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, and finishing up in South Carolina in October. So check out the Collings Foundation. I'll put a link to their schedule here, and you can uh, see if you can see them at one of your nearby airports. Now, speaking of the Pawaukee Airport, I was listening to 
the Simple Flight radio podcast a few days ago, and I learned something that I didn't know. I always thought that the Powaukee Airport was located in the town of Powaukee. Well, it's not. <laughs> it's a rather interesting uh, origin for the name. It's actually uh, the name of the crossroads of two streets uh, that intersect there. Uh, one is Milwaukee and one is Pal something or another. So <laughs> that was kind of interesting. But anyway, check out Simple Flight Radio. Always fun listening to uh, what Mark and Al have to say over there. And let me tell you a little bit about the AOPA regional fly-ins. I'm just back from the one that was held in Frederick. Met a lot of listeners there. It was a lot of fun. So I met several of our Patreon supporters, including Steve Bloom, who was out volunteering uh, by marshalling uh, planes out on the flight line. And he came and picked me up in the golf cart so I could go out there and talk to folks, which was great. Thanks, Steve. And two of our super supporters came to my presentation on Saturday morning, which was three-hour talk on advanced IFR. So they were Stephen Elop and Victor Vogel. And Victor, in fact, had attended a different presentation I gave uh, the month before at Sun and Fun. I also ran into listeners Kira Lynn and Beth. Now, these are two lady pilots who met up over Facebook and have since become good friends. And I also tried to meet up with listeners Rick Turley and drummer Dan, but we weren't able to get our schedules to uh, mesh. So hopefully we'll see them uh, next time. I also met AOPA Senior Manager of Media Relations and Public Affairs, Jennifer Nunn. Now She reached out to me after she saw one of my tweets on Twitter, so it was a pleasure to meet her. And she introduced me to Amelia, who is a writer for the Media Relations Group, so nice to meet you both. Now, one of the really fun parts of the show was the C-47 flyover. Now, these aircraft went on to uh, Connecticut a few days later, where they were joined by five other C-47s, and they're all part of the D-Day squadron of C-47s that plans to fly over Normandy, France next month, and they're going to be commemorating the 75th anniversary of the D-Day invasion. Now, in Frederick, as they flew overhead on one of their passes, they dropped about 20 parachutists, and they were all using the traditional round parachutes in kind of olive uh, drab color, kind of similar to what uh, would have been used during D-Day. So, uh, walking through the exhibits booth, I ran into Mike Lorden, who I haven't seen for many years. He runs ASA, and of course, they sell training materials, and pilot supplies. I asked him what's new, and he showed me a book called Mountain, Canyon, and Backcountry Flying by Amy Hoover. So if you're interested in that, you may want to check it out. I also ran into Mike Shiflett. He's a former DPE from the San Francisco Bay Area, who I've known for some time. He now runs the CFI Boot Camp, and they're training CFIs both in Miami and the San Francisco Bay Area. So if you're interested in becoming a CFI, you might want to check out their offerings at CFIBootCamp.com. I also listened to a presentation by George Bai of Bai Aerospace. He was talking about his electric airplanes, both the E-Flyer 2 and the E-Flyer 4. Just fascinating. And I think we're going to try and get George on the show when those aircraft get a little bit closer to their first shipments. And I also had a nice long chat with uh, Bonnie Caldera. He's the executive sales director responsible for the eastern part of Cirrus's uh, business here in the U.S. Now, he has a company assigned SF-50 Vision Jet that was on display at the show. And we talked about the new auto throttle in the Vision Jet. He says he likes to program it so that it automatically slows the jet to below 200 knots whenever he gets within six miles of a destination airport. And he said the auto throttle is really great on instrument step downs as it maintains the same speed throughout the instrument approach. And of course, it's great in uh, descent from cruise because it's easy to overspeed the aircraft as you're descending. And he also mentioned that the new G2 version of the Vision Jet is noticeably quieter than the G1. And he said you really notice that when you start it up and also during cruise as well. So it was great connecting with him there as well. Overall, it was a great weekend with AOPA, and guess what? We're all getting ready to do it again in a few weeks, but this time it's going to be on the West Coast near San Francisco at the Livermore Airport. So if you're able to attend, mark your calendars. It's going to be on June 21st and 22nd, and I'll be speaking there on both days. And we've just confirmed that on Friday the 21st at 3 p.m., I'll be giving my San Francisco Bay Tour Seminar, which tells pilots how to navigate in and around the complicated Class B airspace near San Francisco. And I'll also have my Bay Tour maps available for sale for anyone who wants to pick up one there. They're $15, and they've been updated. I've included now the new Class B design that went into effect uh, late last year. And then on Saturday, June the 22nd, I'll be giving my three-hour advanced IFR presentation again at 9 a.m., and I'm also going to try and set up a meetup for Aviation News Talk listeners again. I'll send out details on that later. But I am thinking it'll probably be later in the day on Saturday and possibly at a Starbucks that's within 
walking distance from the event at Livermore. And next month in June, besides speaking at AOPA in Livermore, I'll be speaking in Chicago. And that's going to be on Wednesday, June the 26th. And that's being hosted by the Chicago Executive Pilots Association. And I'm going to be talking about night flying safety. So hope to see you there. I'll also be teaching that weekend at the Cirrus CPPP, which is the Cirrus Pilot Proficiency Program, where uh, if you want to sign up for that, you can learn a whole heck of a lot about Cirrus as well as sign up for the flight portion as well. So if you'd like, and I'll include a link to that in our show notes. Now, here's a note from EAA. They are looking for volunteer flight instructors. So if you're a CFI and you're going to be up at uh, EAA Air Venture, or even if you're a ground instructor, they're looking for people to teach in the Pilot Proficiency Center every day. They need 14 CFIs on each shift to operate a Redbird simulator, and they also need uh, two instructors to operate uh, the Redbird Crosswind simulator and two instructors in the ready room to assist pilots in selecting the scenarios they would like to fly. So I will include links to where you can uh, volunteer for that in our show notes. Now, here's a news story, very brief, that kind of caught my attention. I wondered kind of what you thought about this. It said, pilot crashes during slow flight competition. This is from generalaviationnews.com. And there was a slow flight competition in Alaska. And uh, this gentleman was flying his aircraft about 30 feet above the ground at a ground speed of 17 miles per hour when the left wing stalled. He did not have sufficient altitude to recover, so the backcountry Super Cub hit the ground. The plane sustained substantial damage to both wings. The pilot reported no pre-accident mechanical failures or malfunctions, and the probable cause pilot's failure to maintain a proper airspeed. Well, no kidding, slow flight. I mean, I think contests like uh, short field competition, things like that are fun. But slow flight, <laughs> you know, the, the FAA requires that we teach slow flight at 1,500 feet above the ground or higher. I'm just not sure that uh, having a contest to do slow flight at 30 feet above the ground is a you know, really safe thing to do. But anyway, be interested in your thoughts on that. And speaking of crashes, there was one in Colorado that really got my attention. And I, I sent a note to my good friend Rob Mark of Flying Magazine when I saw it, and I sent him the link, and I said in the email, I just want to scream when I see accidents like this. And I said, I just came across this accident, and I was sure as I read it that it must have been the one that you and I talked about in Colorado in episode 106. But no, it was a different non-instrument rated pilot flying at night in IMC in the mountains of Colorado. So all I can say is, Folks, that's just not a really smart thing to do. And again, this was a pilot who'd been licensed, I think, for less than six months. I'm afraid that somewhere in flight training, we apparently are not telling pilots that even though you have three hours of experience flying at night, that does not make you qualified to fly at night in all conditions, especially if there are clouds out there, and particularly if you're going to be flying over the mountains. So anyway, enough said, but uh, I just... Uh, I just couldn't believe it. Uh, I'll include a link to this uh, particular story. I'll tell you why it was particularly heart-rendering. Uh, there were a couple of pictures of the family of four that was on board this aircraft uh, when it crashed. So really very sad. Uh, let me talk about uh, something that's podcasting related here. Uh, some of you I know are listening to me right now on the Overcast podcast app. And Overcast has been updated with support for sharing audio clips of podcast. And so if you happen to use Overcast, you might want to use the new clip sharing feature, which allows you to take a clip of this show or anything else for up to 60 seconds of audio. And then you can share it with your friends, post it on social media and things like that. So if you are using the Overcast podcast app right now, check out the new clip sharing feature, which you can find in the share menu by tapping on the icon on the top right of the player interface and share the Aviation News Talk podcast with your friends. And finally, let me briefly mention our Patreon site. If you are enjoying the show and find value in it, hey, we can offer you some extra goodies if you choose to support the show. So, for example, our $4 a month supporters get copies of the scripts for each of these new shows, and the $8 a month supporters get the scripts plus a list of links to all the stories that we didn't cover in the news because of time constraints. And we've got a number of new supporters, so I want to thank Tony Hernandez, Manny Cotton, Jeff Bowering, and Hamish Keb, who just added his pledge up to $2 a month. 
And if you'd like to become a supporter of our show, please go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome because you're all awesome listeners. And I greatly appreciate your support, both through your donations to support the show, as well as through other things you may do, such as sending us listener feedback, listener questions, or leaving reviews on your podcast app, such as the Apple podcast app. And coming up next, we're going to be talking about avoiding midair and near midair collisions. And I'll tell you that strange tale of my near midair collision with the same aircraft twice. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And welcome back. Today, we're going to talk about midair and near midair collisions and hopefully how to avoid them. But first, let me tell you about my two near misses. Near Midair Collisions, or NMACs, that occurred last week. I'll read the report that I filed with the Palo Alto Tower as part of the NMAC reporting system. On May 15, 2019, at approximately 11.34 a.m., I was in November 512 Alpha Mike and SR-20, and we had two near midair collisions within seconds of each other with the same aircraft, which appeared to be a Gulfstream jet. By the way, I found out afterwards I was correct. It was actually a Gulfstream 4 that I encountered. The incident occurred in the Palo Alto class Delta at an altitude of approximately 500 feet. We were in the traffic pattern making left traffic for runway 13. I was on the upwind leg of runway 13 and observed the other aircraft at about the same time that Palo Alto Tower said to us to, quote, make right uh, correction, uh, make a left turn now. And I think, by the way, what they first started to say was make right traffic, but then they changed their mind and told us to continue in left traffic. Moments later, I was told to, quote, stop your climb. I estimated the jet was three to 400 feet higher than our aircraft, less than 2,000 feet laterally away from me, and on a course to pass just behind our aircraft. Now, candidly, I think the jet was a lot closer than that, but I try not to exaggerate, so I just put in 2,000 feet. Uh, let's see, we leveled off at approximately 500 feet. The other aircraft was not on the Palo Alto Tower frequency. I'm unaware of whether the pilot in the other aircraft was aware of this near midair collision, and I did not report the NMAC to the tower at the time. After the aircraft passed behind us, Palo Alto Tower instructed us to start your left downwind. I had no idea where the aircraft had come from, and I was guessing it was an aircraft inbound to San Jose International Airport that was lower than usual and turning base to runway 12 left or 12 right at San Jose. So I asked the tower, where did that aircraft come from? And the tower responded, they're on an approach for Moffett. They came in a little bit lower than I expected. About that time, the same jet reappeared at 11 o'clock in front of us and approximately 200 feet above us. I estimate that they were approximately 1,000 feet in front of us, and again, I think they were probably actually closer, and our altitudes were converging as they were descending and we were climbing. I took the controls and pushed hard to descend the aircraft and turned left behind it. Had I not pushed, we would have probably been at the same altitude and passed a little behind the Gulf Stream. We landed without incident, but terminated our flying for the day as both the pilot and I were shaken to have come so close to the Gulf Stream twice within a few seconds of each other. Now, by the way, in thinking about this afterwards, I think it's entirely possible that no one was at fault or broke any FARs, which is a little scary when you think about it, and I'll explain that all in a moment. First, let me tell you about the near midair collision reporting uh, system. This comes from the AIM, the Aeronautical Information Manual, Section 7-6-3. It starts off purpose and data uses. The primary purpose of the NMAC reporting program is to provide information for use in enhancing the safety and efficiency of the national airspace system. Data obtained from NMAC reports are used by the FAA to improve the quality of FAA services to users and to develop programs, policies, and procedures aimed at the reduction of NMAC occurrences. All NMAC reports are thoroughly investigated by the Flight Standards Facility in coordination with air traffic facilities. Data from these investigations are transmitted to FAA headquarters in Washington, D.C., where they are compiled and analyzed and where safety programs and recommendations are developed. Section B, definition. A near midair collision is defined as an incident associated with the operation of an aircraft in which a possibility of collision occurs as a result of proximity of less than 500 feet to another aircraft or a report is received from a pilot or a flight crew member stating that a collision hazard existed between two or more aircraft. C, reporting responsibility. It is the responsibility of the pilot and or flight crew to determine whether a near midair collision did actually occur, and if so, to initiate an NMAC report. Be specific, as ATC will not interpret a casual remark to mean that an NMAC is being reported. The pilot should state, I wish to report a near midair collision. D, where to file reports. Pilots and or flight crew members involved in NMAC occurrences 
are urged to report each incident immediately to either one by radio or telephone to the nearest FAA ATC facility or flight service station, or two in writing in lieu of the above to the nearest flight standards district office or FISDO. In section E are the items to be reported, and they are date and time of incident, location of incident and altitude, identification and type of reporting aircraft, aircrew destination, name and home base of pilot, identification and type of other aircraft, aircrew destination, name and home base of pilot, type of flight plans, station altimeter setting used, detailed weather conditions at altitude or flight level, approximate courses of both aircraft to indicate if one or both aircraft were climbing or descending, reported separation and distance at first sighting, proximity at closest point horizontally and vertically, and length of time in sight prior to evasive action, degree of evasive action taken, and finally, injuries, if any. And then they say investigation. The FISDO in whose area the incident occurred is responsible for the investigation and reporting of NMAX. And the last item here, G, existing radar communications and weather data will be examined in the conduct of the investigation when possible, all cockpit crew members will be interviewed regarding factors involving the NMAC incident. Air traffic controllers will be interviewed in cases where one or more of the involved aircraft was provided ATC services. Both flight and ATC procedures will be evaluated when the investigation reveals a violation of an FAA regulation. Enforcement action will be pursued. Okay, so you might be wondering how, when I was in the pattern at one airport, I encountered an aircraft circling to land at another airport. Well, the first thing you need to know is we have a lot of airports here in Silicon Valley, sandwiched in between San Francisco and San Jose. Uh, my home airport, Palo Alto, is the smallest of them all, though it has more operations than any of the adjacent airports. Uh, starting from the airport furthest to the south is San Jose International. They have two parallel runways, and last I heard, about 140,000 operations a year. Most of their traffic is air carrier, and it has a non-standard Class C due to the nearby mountains. Six and a half miles to the northwest is the Moffett Federal Airfield, adjacent to the NASA Ames facility. By the way, it still has three large blimp hangars, one of which was built in 1931 and the other two built in 1941. But these days, unfortunately, Moffett has almost no air traffic, which is really a shame when you consider they've got a pair of runways that are both over 8,000 feet long. It has just a few flights a day that are mostly California Air National Guard, government flights to NASA and Lockheed, and some air ambulance traffic, and it's not open to the public. Four miles, actually 4.1 miles further to the northwest is the Palo Alto Airport. We've got just one runway, which is less than 2,500 feet long, and they handle 190,000 operations a year. Now, these controllers are sharp, and their tower manager has been around for a number of years, and he is, frankly, everything you would want in a tower manager. Uh, seven miles to the northwest of us is the San Carlos Airport, which has a single runway that's just over 2,600 feet long, and San Francisco International Airport is less than nine miles to the northwest of San Carlos. Now, most of the time, the prevailing winds in this area are from the northwest, and so 90% of the time, aircraft land to the northwest, which at Palo Alto would be runway 31. But on Wednesday, we were using runway 13. That meant while we were on the upwind, or what's also called the departure leg, we were flying directly toward Moffett Field. The pattern altitude at our airport is 800 feet, so we typically turn crosswind at 500 feet, which is also the minimum altitude that I teach for pulling the parachute in a Cirrus SR-20. By that time, we're easily a mile, maybe a mile and a half southeast of Palo Alto, and perhaps just 2.5 miles from Moffett Field. Now, normally, that doesn't matter because, as I mentioned, the facility there is vastly underutilized and we rarely see much air traffic there. But apparently a Gulfstream 4 had just flown the ILS to runway 32 right and it was now circling to the north to land on either 14 left or 14 right. Now, back in March in episode 100 of the Aviation News Talk podcast, we talked in detail about approach plate minimums, including circling minimums. And in that episode, I explained that circling minimums are typically used when flying an instrument approach to one runway, and then you circle around to land on another runway. And you might have to do that if, for example, the winds favor one runway, but there's no instrument approach to that runway. Now, how big the circling area is has always depended upon the approach category you're flying. For example, category A, B, and C, and so on. But in recent years, the circling area was expanded. In addition to the category that you're flying in, the circling area is also dependent upon the altitude that you're circling at. Now, since the Gulfstream 4 was under 1,000 feet, it should stay within 2.7 miles of Moffett for Category C and within 3.6 miles for Category D. 
Now, the category is determined by the higher of 1.3 times the stall speed or the speed the aircraft was flying. Now, I looked up the stall speed of a G4, and the source I found said it's 108 knots. And if you multiply that by 1.3, that gives you 140.4, which just barely puts it into category D. Now, Moffat is 4.1 miles from Palo Alto. So if the Gulfstream was in category D, that allows them to be up to 3.6 miles away. And in that case, they could be up to about a half mile from the center of Palo Alto Airport and still be legal, which coincidentally is exactly where they were. I talked to the tower manager afterwards. He told me the radar track showed that they came as low as 800 feet and they came within half a mile of the departure end of the runway. Now, the minimum circling altitude for this approach is 620 feet for Category D and 840 feet for Category E, which would apply if they were traveling faster than 165 knots. So it's quite possible that everyone was operating completely legally, though the Gulfstream pilot would have been right up at the limits permitted for circling. And I'm guessing perhaps based on past experience, neither the controller of Moffett Field or the controller at Palo Alto expected the Gulfstream pilot to go as far north or as low as he did, and hence neither of them pointed out the traffic to me before it became a threat. But I know that as a result of my NMAC report, the controllers at both towers will now be more aware of this potential conflict and probably will make some change to their procedure. And as for me, well, I'll know that on those rare days when I have to take off on runway 13 that I need to be looking for those occasional rare aircraft circling to land at Moffett Field. And by the way, I usually take off at an SR-20 or SR-22 with the engine page displayed on the MFD so that we can monitor the engine performance. And I don't usually switch the MSD to the traffic page until we're above 500 feet and are above the minimum parachute deployment altitude. But I'm thinking in the future, I may start switching to the traffic page a little sooner after takeoff. So let's switch gears and talk a little bit about how frequently mid-air collisions occur. Let's uh, take a sample from some recent years and then go back and look at a couple of studies that have been done on mid-air and near mid-air collisions. So to get a sample of recent reports, I went out to the NAL reports that are put out by the AOPA Air Safety Institute. Now, it turns out the most recent one doesn't include the word mid-air in it, so I had to go back to a couple of the earlier NAL reports. Now there I found that there were seven mid-air collisions in 2014. Five were fatal, causing nine individual deaths. All three occupants of a Robinson R-44 helicopter died in a traffic pattern collision with a Cirrus SR-22. The Cirrus pilots deployed the airplane's ballistic parachute, and he and his passengers survived with minor injuries. That was the only collision between different categories of aircraft. Three of the remaining six involved two certified airplanes, and three were between a certified and an amateur-built aircraft. The pilot of a Hawker Sea Fury survived the collision that killed the pilot of a Cessna 210 during an attempted air-to-air -air photo session. And I remember that crash very well, by the way, as it happened here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Both airplanes were flying home following a fly-in at the Half Moon Bay Airport. In another mid-air that year was the pilot of an American Champion 7 GCBC who made a successful dead stick landing after striking a Cessna 172 in the traffic pattern of the rural Idaho airstrip where they'd planned to meet. The Cessna pilot died in the crash. And the pilot of an amateur-built Sea Ray was actually unaware of the collision that killed the pilot and passenger in another 172 when both aircraft were providing introductory flights. And both pilots died when a Cessna 170 collided with an amateur-built Skykits Savannah. There were no injuries in the collision between a landing van's RV-12 and a de Havilland DHC-1 Chipmunk. And the pilot of a Pitt Special S-1S survived with serious injuries after striking a landing PA-28-140 Piper from behind, and the pilot and passenger in the Piper were unhurt. And if we go back to 2012, there were nine mid-air collisions. Four were fatal, causing six individual deaths. Only one involved commercial flights, and that was a collision between two fixed-wing crop dusters, which is exactly what happened here in California last week. One of the two pilots was killed at that time. There was also a collision between two police helicopters on a department helipad with no casualties. The other three fatal mid-airs include the collision between a Cessna 180 and Cessna 172 over Longmont, Colorado, they killed the pilot and flight instructor in the 172. And a landing RV-6 struck an RV-4 on the runway in Valentine, Nebraska, while operating as part of a flight of four, causing the death of the RV pilot three weeks later. And finally, the owner of a Beach 35 and the instructor administering a flight review uh, died after they collided with a Cherokee 140 in Virginia. 
So that's kind of a sample of what's happened in typical years. Let's look at some of the studies. One was done from 1993. And by the way, we'll work from the older studies to the newer studies. It was called Near Midair Collisions, How Many Really Occur? It was written by Dr. Paul Schuck, who has a PhD in engineering and now lives in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, not far from where I grew up in Wellsboro. He writes that the possibility of an in-flight encounter between aircraft has existed ever since Wilbur first said to Orville, let's build another one. <laughs> a good sense of humor there. Fortunately, mid-air collisions are a rare event, accounting for less than 1% of all aviation accidents. So that's important to know, even though these are somewhat terrifying, they're relatively rare. Mid-air collision safety studies have been frustrated by the combination of high data variability and small population size, because there aren't many of these accidents. There are currently about 60 million flights per year conducted in the U.S. For the past two decades, the number of mid-air collision accidents has averaged about 30 per year. Well, obviously, the number of those has declined, but also the number of hours flown in general aviation has also declined. Uh, since each mid-air collision is presumed to involve two aircraft, it appears that one flight in a million ends in a mid-air collision. So that's a good number to know. He says, near mid-air collisions or NMAX, which occur far more frequently than collision accidents, provide us with abundant data to support safety analysis. The FAA has been collecting pilot-initiated NMAC reports since 1959 and generally receives about 1,000 such reports per year. What do these numbers mean? And he writes that statistically, we can now be 90% confident that the actual number of annual NMAX falls somewhere between 12,900 and 27,700 per year and that the actual percentage of these NMAX reported to the NASA ASRS lie between 0.1% and 3.3%. In other words, about 98% of these never get reported. Now, let's look at another study. This one comes from 2011. It was an MIT study called Mid-Air Collision Risk and Areas of High Benefit for Traffic Alerting. In that study, they looked at 112 accident reports from the NTSB database for mid-air collisions that happened in a 10-year period from 2000 to 2010, and they say, as can be seen, the area surrounding an airport is where mid-air collisions occur most often. 59% are in the vicinity of an airport. And they say the airport pattern was the location with the most accidents, or 45% of them were in the pattern. That study also looked at the angle of intercept between two aircraft in every collision, and over half of those mid-air collisions, 54%, occurred between aircraft flying in the same direction, which, by the way, you'll remember, is the case of the mid-air collision that occurred in Alaska last week. Both of them were returning back to Ketchikan. The study also noted that no collisions were observed where both aircraft were operating under IFR. So that's good news for IFR pilots. Of the 112 reported cases, 50 occurred in the airport pattern, and of the over 80% of those, they happened on final or short final or on the runway. So as a result, the track intersection angle most often observed is that of two aircraft going in the same direction, which we just mentioned. The narratives of these reports paint a similar picture for most of these accidents. Two aircraft on approach to the same runway, settling into each other as they get closer to the runway. This type of encounter is characterized by a rather small relative velocity, which only results in the two aircraft only bumping each other. As a result, 31 of the 50 accidents in the airport pattern were non-fatal. Of the 50 accidents, 9 or 18% involved at least one aircraft that didn't have a radio. And according to a 2007 FAA avionics survey, only 2% of the GA fleet did not have a radio installed. So think about that. 18% of the accidents were aircraft with no radio, but only 2% of the aircraft in the fleet have no radio. So it sounds like no radio aircraft have about a nine times higher chance of being involved in a mid-air collision. Six accidents, or 12%, involved at least one agricultural aircraft. Uh, so according to the FAA avionics survey, 5% of GA hours are flown by ag aircraft. So once again, you can see that ag aircraft are probably about two and a half more times likely to be involved in the mid-air. And of course, uh, we had that accident here in California just last week, which involved two ag aircraft. And the NAL report listed two ag aircraft colliding in 2012. So that all correlates. So it's clear that aircraft with no radios and agricultural aircraft are disproportionately involved in mid-air collisions. Now, there was also a study done in 2017 called Categorization of Near Collision Close Calls, reported to the Aviation Safety Reporting Service, which of course is the NASA program. Now, I should point out that the AIM specifically tells pilots to file near-miss reports with a tower or the FISDO and not with a NASA ASRS program, but 
Apparently, a number of pilots do file near-miss reports with NASA. And ironically, the NASA ASRS program is based at Moffett Field, which is where the aircraft I had my close encounter with was landing. Anyway, the authors of this latest study looked at the occurrence of aviation close calls within the ASRS database. And by the way, the report says that according to the FAA, at any given time, there are 7,000 aircraft in the sky. And for the three-year period from 2014 through 2016, they found just 133 reports of near mid-air collisions. Now, the study authors wanted to categorize just how close the aircraft came to each other, so they eliminated some reports that didn't have that information, yielding them 117 reports for their study. And by the way, they also filtered out training flights, but they don't explain why they did that. Now, that would have filtered my case because we were doing training. In most of the cases, 84 out of 117, the pilot flying or pilot monitoring observed the impending collision. In 17 cases, the impending collision was observed by an air traffic controller. 56 of the 117, or 48% of the close calls, occurred as aircraft were preparing to land. Across all the events, the average distance between aircraft was 265 feet. And the study also shows that a large percentage of events, 72%, were not preceded by any sort of signal or warning. In other words, flight crew members encountered the traffic unexpectedly. Now, by the way, the NASA ASRS program also puts out a report they call the ASRS Database Report uh, in Mac Incidents, which was last updated in August of 2018. They describe it as a sampling of reports that reference near mid-air collision events. And in that report, they include 50 recent NMAC reports. And as I scanned through the report, I was amazed to find that nine of the 50 reports include the word drone in it. So obviously drones are becoming a bigger factor in near mid-air collisions. Also, I'd like to mention there is a near mid-air collision database available from the FAA, and it is searchable. Now, when I put in my local airport, I didn't find anything. But when I searched on Moffett Field, I found two NMAC reports from the past year, uh, one involving a Mooney and another involving a Cessna. Now, unfortunately, the database didn't include narratives for either of those reports, but they did include the pilot names. So I'm going to try and contact those pilots and learn what happened to them. And now let's change gears and talk about avoiding mid-air collisions if we can. There's another good resource available, and that's from AOPA's Air Safety Institute. It's a safety advisor called Collision Avoidance. And it says, most mid-air collisions occur in day VMC within five miles of an airport. They can also be correlated to traffic levels. Most occur between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. on weekends during the warmer months, which of course is when most aircraft are in the air. Half of all collisions occur in the traffic pattern, Check ahead, behind, above, and below your aircraft throughout the traffic pattern, and make sure final is clear before turning. About one of 10 mid-air collisions occur during takeoff and climb, so ensure that the runway is clear before departing and listen for other inbound aircraft. Make position reports and listen for other pilots' position reports at non-towered airports. When climbing out, use shallow S-turns or lower the nose occasionally to get a better view of the area directly in front of the aircraft. If you receive a traffic alert or see oncoming traffic, turn on the landing light to make your aircraft easier to spot. Now, in the busy airspace that I fly in, I teach pilots to turn their landing lights on before they take off because we want other aircraft to spot us as early as possible and to avoid us. So it makes more sense to have the light on all the time in busy airspace than to wait until you see another aircraft before turning it on. Let's see, it says one quarter of mid-air collisions occur during cruise flight, according to the NTSB. The majority of these accidents result from inattention of the aircraft crew. While cruise flight allows pilots the most time to look for traffic, it's also the longest phase of flight and the time of greatest complacency. Scan for traffic and enlist the help of your passengers to spot other aircraft. If possible, avoid high traffic areas, such as the airspace near nav aids and military training routes. And by the way, over the years, I've had two close encounters with aircraft, literally in the middle of nowhere, and both of those were just as I was about to cross a VOR. Let's see, half of all collisions occur in the traffic pattern. Of these, 80% occur during final approach and landing. Check ahead, behind, above, and below your aircraft throughout the traffic pattern to make sure final is clear before turning. Any confusion about where other aircraft are, who's landing, and in what order can have tragic consequences. This is particularly true at non-towered airports. One may conclude, for example, that no aircraft are in the pattern if there is a lack of activity on the frequency. But there may be aircraft operating without radios, or an inbound or outbound aircraft may be transmitting on the wrong frequency. Sterile Cockpit, AOPA Air Safety Institute, recommends that GA pilots limit idle conversation during the first and 
last 10 minutes of each flight in order to concentrate on aircraft operations and scanning for traffic. VFR flight following, you should request ATC radar advisories and flight following services. While only offered on a workload permitting basis, ATC may provide another set of watchful eyes. Non-towered airports monitor the CTAF and make position reports 10 miles out. Include the airport name at the transmission's beginning and end. Report each traffic pattern leg while listening and keeping a watchful eye out for other traffic. Now, here's an incident that they mention, which I do remember reading about years ago. And they say confusion spells ground collision at non-towered airport. Back in November 1996, there was a collision of a Beach King Air and a Beach 1900 in Quincy, Illinois, and it illustrates the potential consequences of incursions at non-towered airports. Cockpit voice recorder tapes from the 1900 indicate that confusion and lack of attention and communications played prominent roles in this disaster. The 1900 was on a straight-in approach for runway 13 and announced its intentions on the CTAF. The King Air announced it was going to take off on runway 4. The crew of the 1900 asked if the King Air was going to hold until they landed. However, a third aircraft at the airport, a Piper Cherokee, who was behind the King Air on runway 4, responded that he would hold, and that transmission was partially blocked, apparently leading the 1900 crew to believe the transmission was from the King Air. The 1900 continued with its landing as the King Air commenced its takeoff roll. They collided at the intersection of the two runways, claiming the lives of all aboard both aircraft. And the safety advisor also talks about proper scanning. They say that a proper scan optimizes our vision for collision avoidance. However, the term may be a misnomer. Scan implies a sweep of the eyes, while the correct scan for conflicting traffic is actually a sequence of intense fixated observations. The eyes need one to two seconds to adjust before they can focus. By contrast, a continuous sweep blurs the vision. While there is no one-size-fits-all technique for an optimum scan, many pilots use some form of the block system scan. And that's to divide the sky into blocks, each spanning 10 to 15 degrees of the horizon and 10 degrees above and below it for a total of 9 to 12 scan areas. Imagine a point in space at the center of each block. Focus on each point to allow the eye to detect a conflict within the foveal field. And we'll talk to you about what that means in a moment. As well as objects in the peripheral area between the center of each scanning block. Also scan vertically 10 degrees above and below your flight path for potentially conflicting traffic. And they also describe the center to side scan, start at the windshield center and scan to the left, focusing in each block. At the end of the scan to the left, return to the center and repeat the scan process to the right. And they also describe the side to side scan, start at the windshield's left side and scan to the right, focusing in each block. MACs are frequently the result of one aircraft overtaking another, so check for overtaking aircraft after every few scans, especially during approach and landing when mid-air collisions are most likely to occur. And here's that explanation on the foveal field. It's under a section called Physiology of Vision. This is the central part of the retina where vision is most acute, but it comprises just one degree of horizontal and vertical vision a focus that's the equivalent of a quarter seen from one eye at a distance of four and a half feet. Anything outside this area will not be seen in detail. That's incredible. I hadn't realized that uh, this foveal region was so small, just a, a degree of, uh, of arc left and right and up and down. It says in practical terms, an aircraft that was visible in the foveal field from 5,000 feet away would only be visible at 500 feet or less if it was more than five degrees on either side of the central vision. Therefore, if you're simply staring straight ahead while flying, you're missing a vast amount of the sky. Focus. They say with proper focus, an object can be right in front of us, yet still remain unseen. In order to spot aircraft at a distance, the eyes must be focused for distant vision. Yet without something distant to focus on, after 60 to 80 seconds, the eyes naturally relax to an intermediate focal distance somewhere just in front of the propeller. To counteract this tendency, known as empty field myopia, the eyes must periodically refocus on the farthest object within sight, a cloud on the horizon, another aircraft at a distance, or a point on the ground. And they talk about CRM, cockpit resource management. They say that requires an effective scan. The more quickly instruments and gauges can be monitored and interpreted, the more time available to scan for traffic. An experiment conducted with military pilots found that the average time needed to conduct an effective scan was a total of 20 seconds. 17 seconds for the outside scan, and 3 seconds for the panel scan. Now, this traffic advisor also talks about traffic systems, and if you fly in a busy area, you should definitely have one. Now, in episode 107, we had a news story about a study that showed GA and air taxi accident rates have had a significant reduction in the likelihood of an accident 
when they are equipped with ADSBN. And it also found the likelihood of a fatal accident decreased by 89% for aircraft equipped with ADSBN. Now, this document also talks a lot about traffic systems. And if you fly in a busy area, you should definitely have some type of traffic system in your aircraft. Now, back in episode 107, we had a news story about a study that showed the GA and air taxi accident rates have had a significant reduction if they're equipped with ADSBN. It found that, for example, the likelihood of a fatal accident decreased by 89% for aircraft using ADSBN. And we're going to wrap up on this topic here just in a moment, but I just want to put in kind of an aside, which is the whole reason the parachute is incorporated in the Cirrus is because one of the co-founders, Alan Klapmeyer, had a mid-air collision back in 1985. And the aircraft he was flying struck another aircraft. Alan's aircraft lost several feet of the outer portion of the wing, and they were just barely able to get that aircraft under control and back on the ground. The pilot and the other aircraft died. And at that point, Alan and his brother kind of thought that there must be a better way, and that became the inspiration for including the parachute in the Cirrus. That way, if a Cirrus pilot has a mid-air collision, at least they have an option that might help uh, save them. Well, just to kind of wrap things up here, I think we can conclude that mid-air collisions themselves are relatively rare, but near mid-air collisions are quite frequent. And to avoid them, you want to be especially alert in the traffic pattern especially when you are turning on the final and when you are on the final. You're also going to want to use flight following, effective scanning techniques, and the help of fellow pilots and passengers look for traffic, have your landing light on in busy airspace, and use a traffic system such as ADSBN. Though if you're using a portable ADSBN receiver, I want to remind you that these systems do not show all the traffic around you. And if you'd like to know more about the limitations of portable ADSB, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to episode 42, and I'll include a link to that in our show notes. Coming up next, listener feedback right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And here's a sampling of some feedback I received. This came from Twitter from uh, Flight Notes is the name of his uh, Twitter handle. He said, had a dream that I won a brand new Cirrus SR-22 and Max Truscott was helping me transition to it from the Warrior. Alas, the panel had a built-in Nespresso machine. <laughs> anyway, that's very funny. I really got a kick out of that. So had no idea that I was in listeners' dreams these days, but uh, sounds like a pretty good dream. And here's a message from Patreon supporter Jerry Smith. He says, hello, Max. I've been a listener for about 10 months, and I finally put some dollars down to support the outstanding work you do. Thanks so much for that. And I read his name back in episode 105. He's one of our super supporters. He says, as a glider guy, I'd be remiss not to put in a plug for you to explore that aspect of GA sometime. And you know what? I think somebody else mentioned that as well. I did do one glider flight years ago, and I think you're right. It is time to start doing something in that area. Here's an email from Chris in Wisconsin. Hi, Max. I enjoyed your avoiding deadly VFR into IMC accidents discussion with Rob Mark, but please add a part two, what to do in the event of inadvertent IMC. In short, here is what I have been teaching. One, fly the airplane and commit to the instruments, specifically the attitude indicator. Two, if you have one, engage the autopilot. Three, ask yourself, am I at a safe altitude? If not, climb and then skip over to step five. Step number four, if apparently climb is not the right thing to do, he says, do a standard rate turn and turn 180 degrees. Five, call for help. This is an emergency. And I know we talked about some of those, but not all of them. And you've put that together in a very nice step-by-step uh, -step procedure. So thank you so much for that, Chris. And from Alan in California, he says, uh, regarding the same uh, episode, good discussion on VFR and IMC. Coincidentally, last weekend, I took my son, who has his private up for the 178 second demo, of course, that's the average amount of time for someone to lose control if they're a private pilot in a simulator in the clouds. He says, your discussion is most timely. And I sent him the link to the show. In the show, you and Rob discuss recurrent training, FAA requirements, airline norms, big thumbs up on that one. For years, I've given myself the gift of an IPC every six months, regardless of nominal currency and even proficiency. I figure that if the airline folks flying every day get that kind of recurrent training, who am I to think that I don't need it? Perhaps this perspective might help some other pilots stay safe and happy. Alan, you make a really good point. If people who fly every day need uh, training every six months, why shouldn't we as GA pilots do the same thing? And here's a review that uh, was posted uh, from Coney. Coney said, as someone who flies glider pilots, tow planes, 
an SR-20, and a variety of power planes for CAP. I'd like to add to your episode 85 on short field landing tips. The most helpful piece of advice I have received was found in Jim Doolin's Contact Fly book. He described the brisk walk approach on short final, where one adjusts the power to maintain the visual illusion of the aiming point, approaching at a constant rate of a brisk walk all the way to touchdown. I found that keeping this idea in mind as I land has made my landings very consistent and stable in all makes of aircraft that I fly. Thanks so much for that. And here's an email from Tim in Arizona who says he listened to episode 107 and wanted to write in to reply to one of the emails I had read at the end of that episode, which was about how Class A airspace and transition altitudes differ in other countries. I talked about some of the differences and he takes a little bit further here. He says international transition altitude is often much lower than 18,000 feet, but is almost never associated with the beginning of Class A airspace. It is just where altimeters are set to 29.92 and flight levels are used instead of altitudes. Many countries don't even use Class A airspace in their system of classification, but if they do, it may start at any altitude. Finally, countries parcel out their flight information regions into an upper and a lower region, what we think of as the jet structure and the victor structure. In the States, all three of these changes happen at 18,000 feet, transition altitude, class A, and a shift to the high structure. But in the UK, for example, transition altitude is generally at 3,000 feet, higher where the terrain is higher, and the upper information regions start at flight level 245. Plenty of other differences, he says. Love the show. Thanks for that, Tim. And here's a message from Patreon supporter Gene, who says, Hi, Max. I started episode 107 on the way to work this morning and heard the shout out about the Schaumburg Flying Club. I should mention that as a group, this is the club he's in, we put criteria out there for all of our members before they fly solo with the new avionics. First, everyone was to download the owner's manuals for the GTN 650 and the G5s. In addition, Garmin has a wonderful GTN SIM app for the iPad. Yes, they do. I use it. In fact, I found it was actually helpful when I was training for the Vision Jet, as some of the things are similar, even though they don't have the GTN 750, they have the G3000. Uh, He says the app is a great way to get familiar with the GTN 650 or 750. Five of us first went up with a CFI who was familiar with the GTN 550 and G5 to get acclimated with the new avionics. All pilots were required to fly with one of these original five pilots as safety pilots, so they were acclimated to the new avionics. Your podcasts are truly a wealth of knowledge. I may have to cancel my subscription to audible.com. I have not listened to a book since I stumbled across your podcast. Thanks for all you do. That's a riot, Jim. I'm sure I'll get some hate mail now from Audible. (laughs) That's so funny. All right. And here is a email from Chris in Virginia. He says, I was listening to your show the other day and heard that you're going to discuss carburetor icing soon. This past weekend, I just bought my first plane. Uh, Congratulations to you. That's pretty cool, Chris. It's a PA32-260, which to me sounds like a Cherokee 6. Has a carbureted engine, and my instructor and I were ferrying her from Oklahoma to northern Virginia in IMC. Near the Pennsylvania-Maryland border, we encountered engine roughness at 5,000 feet or 3,500 feet AGL. This was at night. The plane was new to me and my instructor, and we weren't sure what was happening. But, recalling my old Cessna 152 training days and considering the environment, 12 degrees C and visible moisture, I flipped on the carb heat. Oh, the seconds of horror and discomfort as the engine went from rough to really rough. Internally, I knew it was a good thing the engine went rough as the ice was defrosted and consumed, but boy, those seconds are scary. We did a quick landing at KLBE and called it a night. And I'm thinking, that's usually where people get icing, right over the Appalachian Mountains there. So I'm not surprised you got it near the Pennsylvania-Maryland border. That's not too far from uh, where I grew up. Here's a Facebook Messenger message from Josh. He says, hi, Max. Just wanted to reach out to you about the recent episode you did about VFR into IMC. The trend among pilots to push the limits of weather has definitely been something I have noticed as a CFII in Florida. I have found students just don't understand how dangerous it is and what it actually means to be an IMC. I have found that if you can arrange a flight into IMC with them, it will give them the much-needed reality check about two months ago. I had a student who would really push to go out in varying weather conditions, and I was comfortable with it because I felt I was in control and it was well within my personal minimums as a CFI, but I knew my student had this attitude, so I really wanted to help him understand how dangerous IMC is to a VFR pilot. 
It came up one day when the field we were based at was solid IFR, around 600 feet overcast, and an airport about 15 miles away was VFR, and my student needed to practice landings. So I told him we would file IFR out and go do the landings and come back. He didn't really expect or understand what it meant, and I explained it to him. Shortly after takeoff, my student dropped his pencil at the time we were roughly 300 feet above the ground. He immediately reached for it and looked down. I managed the aircraft while he looked for his pencil. By that time he looked up, we were in the clouds in solid IMC. Total time elapsed was about three to five seconds. And in that moment, he learned how dangerous it is, and he has since completely changed and now has a healthy respect for the clouds. Thank you again for the amazing content. Also, I have really enjoyed the Cirrus. I just finished transition and will begin flying with students in it. I've definitely fallen in love with that aircraft. Thanks so much for that, Josh. And all I can say is wait till you fly the Cirrus Vision Jet. <laughs> You're really going to be in love with that aircraft as well, too. Here's an email from George in Minnesota. He says, hi, Max. I've been following your podcast since its start. I gave you a plug in an article for the Minnesota Fast Team, and I guess they published it as a student forwarded this photo. Keep up the great work. I recommend the show to everyone who I teach and work with. And the photo shows an article that's about learning carbon monoxide dangers by listening to the Aviation News Talk podcast. And I should mention, this is a great opportunity for anyone who wants to help this show if there's an opportunity for you to write an article in any newsletter, whether it's a flying club or an EAA chapter, or if you're a CFII and you work with the FAA FAST team, or write articles for that. Basically, we're looking for ways to get the word out. And I would say that's the single biggest challenge we have is how to introduce new people to the show. So if I can ask you to do one favor, please go ahead and tell just one person you know about this show. And if they're not familiar with podcasts, Go ahead and take their phone from them and show them how they can download our app from the App Store, either on a Google or an Android, by going into a search and just search for Aviation News Talk, just as you would search for any other app on a smartphone. And I just got back a few minutes ago from teaching my So You Want to Learn to Fly or Buy a Cirrus Seminar up in Sacramento. I want to thank all the folks who came out for that presentation. And anybody who is interested in that presentation, send me an email and I will put you on the list to notify you when that becomes available as an online presentation. And of course, if you're thinking about buying any model of Cirrus airplane or jet or you're interested in flight training in one Please call me today for a free consultation. I can sometimes arrange a free demo flight for you. And I'm always happy to talk for free about the ins and outs of buying new versus used. Just call me at 650-967-2500. Or you can go to aviationnewstalk.com and click on contact at the top of the page. And you can also use that to leave any listener questions or just give us any general feedback at aviationnewstalk.com. I specialize in the Cirrus and work with people around the world. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. <laughs>